I wouldn't define populism. There, it's not a uh, it's not a term that you could find exclusive characteristics for it that would match every use of the word populism. Sometimes populist is just a, a synonym for popular. Uh, I've heard uh, Putin called a populist. Ronald Reagan used to be called a populist. I'm talking about a specific political tradition that begins in the United States in the 1890s and then travels across the Atlantic in about mm, 1970 or so and becomes a big deal in Europe in the 1990s, about 20 years later. And it basically consists of um, seeing politics as a conflict between the people and the establishment or the elite. And who the people are and who the establishment is and what the particular causes are, are, are involved uh, depends upon the movement, the party, and the person, and the period in history. So they change. In the United States, the original kind of populism was the People's Party. And that's a populism that's primarily uniting the, the middle and the bottom of society against the top, against the money power, then later Wall Street and what have you. Uh, Bernie Sanders is that kind of populist. Syriza in Greece was Podemos in, in Spain. Those are, those are examples of left-wing populism. Then you get groups that also see themselves as clashing with the establishment or the elite on behalf of the people. And they do have the same, very, a lot of the same issues. For instance, Donald Trump was as concerned with runaway shops, corporations that move overseas in order to avoid paying high wages, as Bernie Sanders was. He was also against uh, corporations that moved their headquarters in order to pay, avoid paying taxes. So, you know, and in the Tea Party, you found, find uh, opposition to Wall Street. But you also find a third thing, which is the idea that this establishment or elite is coddling a, another group, an outgroup, uh, African Americans, Mexicans, uh, Muslims. Uh, at the expense of the people, so that's the—I mean—that's the—that's the other element that you get in in right-wing populism. Now, the the what, what I was going to say in terms of qualifying it is, if you look at the domestic program of, let's say, the Front National in, in France, it's to the left of the Democratic Party in the United States yeah. on, on national health insurance, on banks, on all these kinds of issues. So. The, the Danish, uh, P, Danish Folk Party, the yeah. same thing, uh, pro on some issues to the left of the socialists there. So it's a, uh, it's a tricky definition, but, but there is a difference, again, between, um, uh, let's say, Podemos and uh, between the Front National and between Bernie Sanders and, between, and Donald Trump. And that's, that's the right and left uh, distinction. Would you define the old right as being populist? I don't, uh, I never heard of this alt-right until the uh, middle of the Trump campaign, and I think it was, uh, it, 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 they're groups that are very, very marginal to American politics that were elevated in part by the liberal media and uh, by the Clinton campaign in order to, to uh, brand the tr Trump uh, uh, himself and his and the Republican Party as being really on the on the far extremes. Um, I don't I don't think it's a. Um, so do you, are you suggesting that the alt right is a creation of liberal media? I there you know there obviously there are some people there are white supremacists there there's been a Nazi party in the United States of some kind uh, for what sixty years or seventy years, uh, and you can always go out and find these people demonstrating or something like that, but they 're very, very marginal to american politics i, I just don 't uh, I think their importance is being uh, uh, elevated right now. If Marine Le Pen managed to win that election, which I very much doubt will happen, but of course, I doubted that Donald Trump would be elected too. Um, that would be a real change in European politics, and it would threaten the fabric of the EU. I mean, the other thing about the um, free, Freedom Party in, in um, Austria is that's a pretty prosperous country. 
that you're not talking about Greece or Italy or Spain or Portugal, and they were not uh, anti-EU or anti-Euro uh, the way that the parties in in France, uh, Holland, uh, those parties, and that's that's really where the crack can come. That's where you could get a lot of uh, problems. Brexit, you know, Britain wasn't part of the eurozone, yeah. but that currency, if if a big country pulls out of the eurozone then you're going to see a lot of chaos. Why do you think uh, the immigration issue has been so central in populist rhetoric? Economically, uh, I, I know there's research that says that uh, countries benefit by it. Uh, I think a lot, some of that is propaganda because uh, one of the main benefits from the standpoint of business is it really does uh, put downward pressure on wages, especially if you get a real, really large influx of uh, immigrants. And uh, that, in the United States, that's been the case, uh, unskilled workers, semi-skilled workers, and it's transformed a lot of occupations, for instance, in construction, hotels, restaurants, meatpacking, mm -hmm. From, you know, lower middle class, middle class into a very, uh, if I could use this word, it's not a status word, lower class, low wage oc occupations where people are just getting by, sometimes dirty, dangerous, uh, like meat packing, which again used to be unionized, middle class. Uh, so there is a whole, there is a really important economic dimension. And, you know, you can say, well, uh, the country benefits because we get a larger population. That means more economic growth. But again, you could automate a lot of those jobs, theoretically, and, and it's happening in the United States. One of the features of populist movements is that they make demands that the leadership of the country is unwilling to grant. And that's how they demarcate themselves uh, as a movement, representing the people against the establishment. Bernie Sanders, uh, f free ed public education in colleges, uh, Medicare for all. These were demands that nobody in Washington would, would have been willing to grant. But they weren't inconceivable. They weren't things that, you know, no country could grant, because obviously that, that's the kind of thing you could find in Canada or in Western Europe. My oppression, again, of, of, of Syriza is that they were demanding an end to austerity, the reduction of the debts. And the central to their case against the socialists and against the center right was that they were going to make that central to what they were doing. And that's how they, that's how they distinguished themselves. Once they got into power, they didn't deliver. They couldn't deliver. They backed down. So in effect, they were, they were doing the same thing that the socialists had done, what was it, four or five years earlier in 2010. This is the same thing that Podemos fears will happen in, to them in yeah. uh, Spain as well. So in that sense, they, they're, they're, they become a governing party, but they no longer are a populist party. They're no longer representing the people against the leadership in the, in the country. They, can, they could... Go, you know, this happens in Latin America. They could say, well, we're fighting the, the EU or we're fighting the business establishment, but that's not, as my impression is, that's not the case. They're still compromising. They're still trying to get the, uh, uh, they're, they're still passing uh, 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 bills in, in the legislature to get the Greece to agree to the terms of ter austerity. So, uh, and I would be, wouldn't be surprised if they get voted out in the next election. And they'll get voted out the same way the socialists got voted out. So, so again, you know, you could use the term populist to describe them, but I, I think it's more illuminating in this case to say that when they, when they took power, uh, they lost that edge. Do you find anything positive in populism? Are there any, like, elements in that movement, if we could put like everything under the same roof, like that you personally think are a force for good, or do you think uh, populism should be, uh, uh, I don't know, did, uh, dismantled or kind of like uh, turned to something? Outlawed? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be a great idea. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's a, well, what I just say, argue in the book is that it's an early warning signal that a prevailing worldview, that a prevailing way of doing politics and policy no longer works. Uh, and I think that's true of both the right wing and the left wing varieties that uh, United States, we have to figure out a way to deal with this society where 30% are doing very well and 70% are not doing as well. Uh, and uh, the, both Trump and Sanders were symptoms. Um, they were they were making cl they made clear that there was a problem. Whether they had the solutions to them is something else. And that's been the pattern of these kind of populist movements all along. They raise issues that the leadership is not willing to recognize.